It's uh, tough for us to start. Please find the uh, find the seats, and uh, and we're going to start the uh, talk today. Of course, it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Joseph Hellerstein to our CS seven awards this week. Of course, uh, Professor Hellerstein is from UC Berkeley. Uh, won many awards, including the Sigmund uh, Todd Education Award, as well as other awards, including the Test of Time Award, which is a wonderful number and, and testament to the type of work that we're going to hear about today. And uh, uh, finally, there's something that is, I don't know if anyone noticed in the bio that a person like uh, Joe uh, is, is plays with yes. world uh, uh, famous musicians including our own Mike Carey. And here is actually something that I would like you to know that some of the audience here has actually heard you speak before. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so don't, don't, don't be shy if you wanted to try something with me. Yeah. It's a musical, actually. It's a <laughs> first thing you saw. You go first. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, always fun to speak with Kevin Irvine. It's great. His family kind of place to be. So thanks for having me. Um, the work I'm going to talk about today is a collaboration between um, Berkeley and Sutter Hill Ventures, um, which is, uh, you may know as Ball, but uh, one of the oldest firms in Silicon Valley in venture capital. They funded Visa and Secure and Snowflake. They like to do very few companies and then get very engaged in them. So one of the things they've done, which great for me, is um, they're funding a couple programmers for this research project out of their pocket, um, just because they think maybe someday this will be important. So there's no expectations on their part. They're they're um, just contributing to the open source. So they're also, um, yeah. So this uh, group spans, I've got my two developers from Sutter Hill. Lucky actually, unfortunately, just left us, but he's done a lot of the work you see today. Um, my colleagues, Alvin and Natasha, uh, former postdoc in Milano, current postdoc at Mobile, and uh, these wonderful guys. So this is the team. Um, and I'm very lucky to work with them. Um, this is my uh, my stump speech opening slides that I've been using for five years or so. Um, you know, there's this saying that I learned from my operating systems colleagues that with every architectural generation comes a programming environment that unlocks the potential of the new hardware. So famously in the PDP-11, it was Unix and C. And I think the story in part comes from the sort of Turing Awards for Richie and Thompson. But you can see that um, you know, in other environments, there have been new programming models that sort of fit the environment. Um, and uh, the whole idea is kind of, you know, there's an app for that, right? If you get the right programming model, then your platform will do things you never even expected. Your programmers will find things to do with your, your platform that you didn't expect. And so I think one of the big questions is, well, what about the cloud? So this is the biggest computer humankind has ever assembled. Mostly all we've done is rebuild IBM and Oracle products on it. So that was mostly done by the vendors, right? Um, and you know, what are people doing now that they have a million computers? Well, programming them in Java, which is crazy, right? It's insane. So the real question I think is how will folks program the cloud in a way that lets someone in their garage who we didn't realize was a genius build the thing we didn't know we wanted, yeah? And um, the thing is distributed programming is really hard. That's not gonna happen if we're programming in a single computer programming environment. Um, and today's, you know, distributed programming is hard. There's parallelism, there's data consistency, there's the issue that parts of your system are always down. Um, and then auto scaling makes it even harder. So if you want your system to efficiently shrink to zero when it's not being used and scale up when it's being used by lots of people, that makes the problem even harder. And, you know, today's software stacks just don't help with this at all. So I think, you know, self serving, entirely self serving, but I think this is one of the most important things we should be working on in computer science. Um, what more could you want from your compiler? We have LLVM, it's awesome. It came out of research at Illinois. You know, this is absolutely academia to impact. Um, but I want something like this that answers these questions. Is my program consistent? Will different machines disagree about the state of the computation over time? How can I partition my state safely if it doesn't fit on one box anymore? And how can I replicate my state safely so that some of it can be close to my customers in Australia and some of it can be close to my customers in California? Um, what, what failures can this system that I've built tolerate? How many of them? Uh, what data is going where and who gets to see it? These are questions in the cloud that have become very important. <clears throat> and then, you know, we really want tunable objective functions. Optimize the outcome of the compiler for spend in the cloud, not for latency. Or, I don't know, I want my 99th percentile to have good performance, not just my 95th percentile. I'm willing to pay for that. Please, compiler, generate the right code. 
right? And if you ask LLVM these questions, it's like, oh, you have no idea what you're talking about. There's no way to tell your compiler these things today. They're not interested in these questions. What they do, they do very well, but it's all about a single machine, right? So um, Hydro is our effort to start moving into this space. I'm not gonna claim to solve and answer all these questions today, but this is a, a multi-year journey that I've been on for quite some time. Um, and I expect it will continue into the future. Uh, but I think these are important problems for you know, computer science to be working on. So as background, before this crop of people uh, on the, the slide that you saw, I had a set of students who really just wanted to do systems work. And one of the students uh, went out and I said, well, if you want to build distributed systems, let's build the simplest distributed system you can possibly think of, which is a key value store, or essentially a register, a memory, a distributed memory, a database that you can put and get things in a solid place. So there's like no algorithms in such a thing. Right. Um, the focus is all about what's your data consistency, what's your performance, and how do you deploy this thing so that it'll be uh, cost efficient or, or performance efficient. So the lead student, Cheng Han Wu, um, who won a um, Sigma dissertation award for this work, he built an outrageously fast and quite uh, semantically rich system called Anna. Um, and then he showed how to make it auto scale. So it's a series of two papers, um, award winning papers. And really briefly, um, here's three plots from the Anna papers. I'll start with the big one. This is a system, here's the number of threads running uh, a workload, what it gets. And you can see it scales across cores on the multi-core 32 core processor hugely linearly. And then a tiny hiccup when we go to two processor, two machines, I'm sorry. And then it just keeps scaling linearly. And it does this forever. It's very hard to build a system that scales linearly. It really, really is hard. Uh, and there's a reason it does this, and we'll talk about that. Um, partly because it's super simple, um, but you know, building systems that scale linearly is much harder. And so this is like a very cool chart. If you built real things, um, this is interesting and surprising. More importantly, under high contention, this thing is absurdly fast. So the blue line is Anna um, with you know, lots of storage figures. Um, and the yellow lines and green lines and red lines are, sorry, the red and purple lines at the bottom were leading alternatives. So Intel's thread building blocks library, which is Intel's multi-core hash table, was one thing we compared against, right? So we're only going up to 32 threads. It's a single machine. It's a shared memory hash table from Intel. And then the other one, the purple one that you can't see was, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, the red one is Mastery, which came out of uh, Harvard Fuller's value store. And under high contention, Anna is 700 times faster than this system. And this is the kind of performance charts that make me happy. I, I, you know, I, I can quibble with people about your 20% faster in this experiment. I don't believe your experimental setup. When you're 700 times faster, there's something about this workload at least that you're doing something very different, right? And that's interesting. So I like when I get charts like this from my students. And the reason for this is all here. Um, when Anna's under contention, that, that it, uh, the keys and values are, are commonly shared across the worker. 90 plus percent of the time we're doing big put. We're basically do handling puts and gets. 90% of the, the time spent is in handling puts and gets. And with TBD and Mastery, 90% of their time is spent in concurrency control. So because of contention, um, both, I think TBD is using um, atomics. So it's trying and failing to do a, a comparison swap. And I think Mastery might be using lots, I forget. But in any case, it's basically deciding not to work because of contention. Uh. And we're deciding to work. And we'll talk about why we're able to do that when those guys aren't uh, in a sec. There's a hand already. Yes. I, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but is it an optical illusion or do, I, do you see a very slight uh, uh, flattening of the curve on the blue line there? So, yeah, no, I think it might not be perfectly diagonal linear. Yeah. It's linear, but the slope might not be the 94 threads that you could get. That's not an optical illusion, I don't think. Although I could scale my y axis. I don't know. I don't know. The other thing I'll point out, and this is kind of the, the, the um, takeaway for today's talk, it's not a Anna talk, is that this was handwritten by Cheng Gang for his PhD. He's a clever fellow and a very good programmer um, and founder of a startup now. Um, and he's correct because he said so, right? So it gives exactly the consistency that he claims because of proof by assertion, right? Um, so we might like something better than that, yeah? First of all, can we make this easier so that anybody can launch stuff in the cloud and make it work? And second of all, can we make it more reliable in the sense of like type systems make your code reliable. There's a proof, there's a mathematics to your programming that's guaranteeing the claims of consistency and so on. So the consistency claims of both are similar. The consistency claims are similar um, and the math behind them is similar, but 
in Chang'an, you, you read the paper and you say, oh, it's semi lattices, okay. But in HydroFlow, the compiler is saying this type of semi lattice, this type of semi lattice, this type of semi lattice, or the composition is semi lattice, so the whole thing is kind of plotting across the row, blah, 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 and there's different types of things. Therefore, the uh, consistent across the rows. And I'll talk about all that math a little bit as we go on. Okay, so that's the flavor of what I'm shooting for. I want people to be able to do Chen Gang in their garage easily without programming C++ 24 or So the idea is to build some kind of LLVM for the cloud. What would that look like? Um, I want compiler optimizations that have to do with elastic distributed computing, right? So the optimizations that LLVM worries about are like, you know, cache locality and unrolling loops and all that stuff you learned about in your compilers class. We have different problems. We want to talk about how to partition the data, how to replicate the data, those kinds of things. And then I want compiler guarantees for correctness that have to do with distributed systems correctness now with single code correctness, right? Your LLVM doesn't take your program and do incorrect reordering of your lines of code or incorrect unrolling of your loops. It does it correctly. We need to do the same for distributed stuff. Like I've now replicated your machine across the globe. I've therefore replicated your data across the globe and it's out of sync. Um, why should I think the program is right anymore? Yeah. So I want the compiler to just tell me, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. You don't have to think about distributed consistency. The compiler promises you. And then, of course, you know, what kind of outcomes do we want? What are our optimization goals? Um, what do we want? Do we want this to high throughput? I would like this system to be polyglot the way LLVM is, right? LLVM sits under Rust, C++, and Swift, and probably more. Um, I would like what we built to be similar. I, I tried selling programming languages for distributed systems before. It's a bad business. I don't recommend it <laughs> selling as an academic, but still, it, it, nobody wants to adopt your weird thing. And if they do, you're lucky, and I want to be the thing that makes you lucky. I don't want to be uh, trying to get lucky. Um, and then I want it to be cost-effective. We should try to be, you know, uh, make good use of cloud resources. These are goals. I've not achieved them all yet. I won't promise that at the end of the talk you'll believe that this is doable, but hopefully you'll see a road ahead. So here's the stack we envision at the beginning of the paper. Uh, many of the languages or programming frameworks on top. So if you distributed systems programming, you've probably heard of things like actors or features or um, maybe functional programming, or, or maybe you're a geek like me with logic programming in distributed systems. But all of these are options. And then in some sense, we will turn them into our internal representation logic. Um, and one of the games we want to play is using my colleague Alvin Chung's techniques for verified lifting, which I won't talk about today, but it's cool stuff. He can turn like Fortran into CUDA. He can turn Java into Spark. It's pretty cool. It doesn't always work, but when it works, you're like, yeah, I'm amazing. Um, so we want to try to do some of this lifting in a language that's kind of a global distributed IR. So some kind of internal language, but you program it, or the compiler understands it as being a program spec that doesn't talk about distribution. It treats the whole cloud as a single computer. And then we want to compile that down to another language that runs on each load, and that's HydroFlow. And that is also going to be a language we design an internal representation that runs on each machine. And then this is going to be compiled by Rust, actually, um, to a thing that deploys it in the cloud. Okay, so that's kind of the vision. And today we will mostly talk about HydroFlow because that's most of the work we've done. We have done some work here and we're beginning to do some work here, but most of our work has been here. We're starting from the bottom up. Um, and the picture is you get a representation of a component of a distributed system to run on a single machine. And you give it to the Rust compiler. We prove things about it behaving nicely in the distributed context. And then we gain, thanks to LLVM, efficient local code. But the type checking on the correctness for a distributed system is happening actually here. And then we get it done. Yeah. So HydroFlow is an embedded language in Rust. You know, and you build a single node. You can think of this as an actor, although it's kind of a data flow actor. Um, we call it a transducer because some of the theory literature in the space calls these things transducers. Um, and a lot of words are taken. So you don't want to call it an agent or an actor or things because people get confused. So we'll just call it something fancy for now. We'll call it a transducer. And many communicating transducers are a distributed system. Okay. So that's kind of the frame. All right, so the body of the talk, there's kind of four chapters. I doubt we'll get through them all. I generally have more slides than I present, and um, I'll try to leave time at the end for questions. So, um, or you can stop me on the way, but we, we don't have to go through all the slides. This is not a forced march. But if we did get through all the slides, I'll teach you about HydroFlow and show you what it looks like and what it builds in the little program. Um, we'll actually build the Anna Key Value Store in a minute. Um, I'll talk a bit about compilation and performance, and then hopefully we should have some time to give you some of the theory for why this stuff 
gives proofs of consistency. Uh, and then we yeah, have time permits. I'll show you some optimizations we've pulled off, but I'll probably only have time to just brag, show you the slide and say, look at that. <laughs> we'll see. All right, let's look at Hydroflow so you get a sense of what I'm talking about. Hydroflow is like a graph specification language. So has anybody ever used graph viz? Yeah, they're familiar. Um, or maybe uh, it'll look a little bit like something like pandas or um, Spark, if you like. But really, it's literally a graph specification language. Programs look like this. You can have arrows between boxes. Okay, so operator one feeds data operator two. Um, it's supposed to be human programmable. So it's hidden in the compiler. Most mere mortals in the future probably wouldn't program it. But if you wanted to, you could get in there and you could, you could tweak the compiler outputs. You could program by yourself, just like in LLVM and other modern compiler stacks, Halide being one that's commonly used now for uh, graphics. Um, but it is a compiler target. So if you don't love it, that's okay because you probably will never program it. Okay, but I'm, I'm showing it to you so you'll understand it, right? Because this is what our, our, this is essentially like our virtual machine, if you want to think of it that way. And this transducer is a sync core thing, remember, our little turtle runs on one core, um, and we're building data flow programs. So these are type data flows and operators. And the set of operators we have is the familiar stuff you'd see in a Spark or a Pandas or a database query engine. It's um, the relational algebra and stuff. Or if you like, it's the typical functional things like maps and reduces and stuff. All right? But we're not trying to build a batch processing analytics system. We're trying to build something that can write, that can basically run like very low latency network protocols. So this thing has to be as fast as handwritten C code on like handling an event. Right? So don't think of this as Spark. Spark's the wrong model. It's a very inefficient system, actually. This is a very low latency efficient system. It's just that it's got the same syntax in some sense as a language like Spark. Um, and if you, because I'm a database person trained by Fitzer Carey and his ilk, um, I'm basically saying everything in the world should be a query plan. All programs should be query plans. Why? Because we know how to scale and distribute query plans. If you go run a query in um, SQLite in your, on your phone, take that query and you run it on Snowflake, it'll run across a million computers and you won't know the difference. Right? SQL scales beautifully. Fortran does not. <laughs> Right? So there's something about the way we think about query plans that allows us to scale up. Can we generalize that to a general purpose program? In some sense, that's part of the conceit here is databases take over the world. But I try not to say that out loud unless like my team is. Okay. So let's build a key value store out of a data flow. Data is going to come in from the network like requests. Put, get, and I think it was somebody yesterday was talking about what's the difference between like a UI event and a network event. And in HyperFlow, there's none. Things come in from the outside. They're asynchronous. They come in over the network. We're going to demultiply the messages. There's only going to be two kinds of messages that we're going to handle. And there might be a third edge that is, I don't know what you're talking about, error, but let's go with that one. The puts and gets. If you send a put into a key value store, then I want to store the data in a hash table. If you send a get into the key value store, I want to do the moral equivalent of a relational join, which is look things up in a hash table and send a key up. Okay, so this is literally a, a streaming relational join operator. Put streaming into the hash table where they're being accumulated, and you've got get streaming into the hash table being closed. That's the whole program. That's a key value store for a single core. And it's as dumb as you would expect it. It's a hash table lookup machine. It's not supposed to be fancy, right? It shouldn't be 1,000 lines of C++. It should be this, okay? So um, you know, this is a little ugly. We'll have to deal with network wire stuff. So we deserialize this stream. We multiplex these types of these messages into puts and gets. Right, so that's that much of the data flow in Hydroflow. And we're going to assign this branch to be called puts and this branch to be called gets. And we're going to stick them into the two inputs of a thing called lookup that we haven't defined yet. Lookup is two inputs, zero and one. And lookup, lookup is this box, the join. Okay, it's just a variable that it's, it, it, it is a data flow signal that is this, this operator, this schema. And then the output of the join is going to go over that. And I skipped a little bit of stuff. On the left hand side of the join is static, so it's going to remain over time. The right hand side of the join persists only for as long as the event handler takes. This stuff pools in state, and this stuff flows, and then it's forgotten. And that's the whole program. A little, little bit more detail. So there's some messy manipulations with map functions that reorder reordered uh, parts of the message so the API works, but that's not particularly interesting. Uh, that is the whole program. 
that's a singular key value store. Now what we want to do is, well, first of all, I want to say that you know you can ask HydroFlow to show it to you and it'll, it'll spit out a graph that is actually of the program if you want to look at that. It's kind of nice. Um, but let's say we want to replicate this thing. So now it's a distributed key value store. It's actually not that much harder. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to add a little more logic. And one more piece of state you need to make this distributed, which is where are the machines participating in this distributed system? What are their names and addresses? And so what we're going to do is we have another hash table, which is those machines that are participating in the system. And you can join the system at any time. So another kind of message, which is, please, I'd like to join the system and be a participant. Okay. So that's the third kind of message now that we'll handle in the class. And this is going to be not a relational equi join, but a cross product join. All pairs join between um, things you want to store, puts, and machines in the system. So for every put, for all machines, put it on the fat machine. Okay? And then send it out to those machines. So this is the, remember, this is the names of all the machines. These are all the puts. This is going to pair a put request to a destination. And this is going to send that put request to that destination. <clears throat> And then it's going to get stored in this part of that machine's load. Yeah. This is not meta state. Meta state? I don't know what that means. Um, you're saying it needs to go to these other machines. So I'm wondering whether it is an hydro flow or the level above. So I understand the question, and I'm going to try to be um, obnoxious in the answer. So the question is well posed, <laughs> which is this is like state of your program, and this in some sense is the control state or you know, it meta states the word you use. This is something about the configuration of the system. Shouldn't you separate those? And I'm going to say, no, this is the bottom level of a compiler. Data is data. Instructions are instructions. Your registers don't care whether they're state or meta state. Why should I care? When I put something in a register, it doesn't know if it's control flow or data flow. That's a bunch of nonsense, right? That's a conceptual thing that we use for architecting systems. Compilers don't give a damn. So here, I'm, everything's a relational query in some sense, a streaming relational query. I don't care whether you think of this as state or you think of this as meta state um, at this level of the way. Now, two levels up in the programmer's abstraction, that's probably mm -hmm. true. So that's, I was being obnoxious to make this distinction between what do we care about at the low level of the compiler or what kind of architecture or program we're going to separate. Yeah. So take me on that thread a little bit. Mm -hmm. There is some level of consistency that you're acquiring in the system. Yes. Between HT2 and HT1, basically, otherwise, the things would not work, right? Well, we'll talk about that. We'll give you a couple slides. Oh, sure. But right. then you can ask me the question again, because you might not like sure. the answer. Okay. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's matters of opinion are going to start to crop up. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, this is the remaining code for the extra data flow that I showed you. It's another screen full, you can see here's, it joins come into the top, and then when a peer joins, we have to stick it in that cross join, right? And then nodes have to send their puts to the other nodes, right? And that's what this logic does. But, you know, it's not a lot more. And this is the entire program, one screen, as, as emitted by the compiler. Note that it's a whole bunch of green edges. What I'm gonna promise you is that if your program is all green edges, you can replicate it consistently. That's a type check that the compiler is telling us. If you'd seen a red edge, then you would have had to worry about consistency. Now, this is eventual consistency in a strong sense. So if the system were to quiesce, all the nodes would agree. <laughs> you may attach to a node that is behind some other node in some way. Um, if your code is green, then your client code will also end up being fine. If the client code is red, then you're going to have to do something. This is where it's a matter of opinion. You know, where are the boundaries of my system? This thing says I'm happily eventually consistent, but really your clients should care also, right? So this is a whole long conversation I don't want to have right now, but I'd be delighted to have offline, um, which is um, what does it mean like to read state? So if you read things and you just use like a, a, a traditional read, write, or put, get, or uh, whatever interface, reading is non-monotone. We're going to talk about monotonicity in a minute. Observing this thing breaks it in some sense. You're not really allowed to read things. You're only allowed to read things that are true forever. <laughs> and let me give you a concrete example of that. It's not in the slides. But if you go to a key value store and you say, what's the value stored at key three? It might say 17. And it might have been yesterday's value. And now it's not 17 anymore. So it told you a thing that is no longer true. 
and anything it tells you may not be true in the future. So in some sense, the information it's giving you, it might need to retract. So that's non-monotone. It's saying a thing is true. Oops, I'm sorry, it's not true. Right? So it goes from false to true to false again, and that's terrible. But if it told you, as of this time, the value is seven, as of yesterday, the value was seven, that's true forever. And that's kind of the way to think about how we're going to live in this world. Okay, It's not the only way to live in this world, um, but it is, it is a way to live in this world that's familiar to us who do reason rights a lot. So facts that are sort of sealed, as long as they're timestamped in some distributed way, like a collector clock, they're true forever. But the true as of, right, it's the as of date on your information. And it is what it is. It might be useful to you, it may not. Okay. If you really want to uh, dig in, you know, we wrote a, Documentation turns into books now. <laughs> so if you go to the <laughs> website, it's beautifully formatted. It's a thing that looks like a book. Um, it's the docs for the language. Um, and you can read it. All right. I want to talk a little bit about whether this thing can be made to be fast, because I claim that everything should be a database query. And you probably all went, that's the stupid database. They're slow. Right. I, well, I see agree. <laughs> so a few of you agree. Uh, but for the most part, like uh, I remember talking to Pat Hanrahan, famous Turing Award winner. Um, and uh, he would always say, graphics people know how to get performance, but database people not so much. And you know, that was totally fair, I think, in a lot of ways. So we need to hit the kind of performance that people who count instructions care about. Right? Um, and I'd point out that batch processing, a la Spark, Snowflake, and OLAP systems, if you're a database person, it's really easy. It's just about bandwidth. You know what? Getting bandwidth off of disks and processors and interconnects in 2024 is like almost free. You almost can trip over yourself and build a data warehouse. I mean, I'm exaggerating a lot, but it's a solved problem. Event handling data flow for really low latency is much more demanding, right? And so the things we're doing are not common. Uh, to, to use query plans to build the interior of the system is weird, um, and people aren't good at it yet. So we've done some things to make it better. One of them is how do you take one of these data flow programs, which is really this is really like a reactive actor kind of thing. It might be that only one message comes in in a tick. So instead of thinking about a stream of you know, a, a million tuples, think about one message comes in. How few instructions can I use to get it off the bottom? <clears throat> right? That's my goal here. So I really want to get my instruction cut down. So what we do is we partition any data flow graph into trees. And the trees are what we call in-out trees, where the top of the tree is pulling data, and the bottom of the tree is pushing data. So this is a data flow system that's a mixture of pull and push, but it gets broken down into subgraphs that pull at the top and push at the bottom. Or maybe better visualized, there's a pivot point. And you can think of this as the controller or the scheduler for this data flow. So this says pull, 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 push, push, push. And this, this guy does the push logic, this the logic. So we've segmented our graph into the pull part and the push part. And then we give this to the Rust compiler, and it goes, ha, 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 I can inline that whole thing into a series of instructions. It's just a loop. This is for everything here. Do this. And the Rust compiler is really good at making that fast. All right? It uses a lot of morphization to inline everything if you're a Rust type to work out. Um, and so this is my uh, former master's student, now programmer, Ming Wei Samuel's thesis. This generates really fast code because this whole pull push tree becomes one inline function. There's no function call to me. Okay. Um, I haven't seen this trick before. For what it's worth. If you know someone who's done this trick before, it'd be good because we haven't written a paper yet and I would like to brag about it, but if there's a reference I should put in, I will. Of course, even the example we showed wasn't an in-out tree, it had extra stuff. And so you do need like a buffer and a handoff to a scheduler when your tree is not a tree, when it's a DAG or a, or a segment. You do hand the segment, the segment's really important. It's basically recursion. So um, we partition this thing into in-out trees connected by hand. Handoffs like a buffer and a scheduler uh, uh, yield. All right, so this is a reminder. You've seen the slide already. Upper right was the C implementation of GAMMA. There's that same graph. We ran this on some Amazon machines in 2018. And in 2023, we grabbed some GCP machines <coughs> that were about the same. And we took a version of the code you saw, not exactly the code you saw, but pretty close, um, not a lot longer. Um, and we ran it on those machines and we, we hit the performance that Chang'an is doing with the, the data flow specification of the code. Okay. So we're now as fast as Chang'an. Chang'an stuff is really fast. The reminder, it was beating the Intel thread building block library. So pretty good. Pretty good. Um, and you know, 350 million operations per second puts and gets. The only 
that could drive this thing to saturation was having the client be baked into the application itself so that the requests weren't coming in over the network. So the network's too slow to drive it this far. So we were co-locating the client with the server to see how far the server could scale. This is an absurdly good number. Um, so at least on some instance of a program, our compiler can generate really fast code. Is it always going to generate really fast code? I don't know. I'll have to wait and see. But there's evidence that we're moving in a reasonable direction. OK. I'm going to pause there because we're going to switch main stem parts and talk about Julia in a second. Yeah. How do you decide which part to push which part? The, the nature of the operators. Operators are either push or pull. Um, and that's part of their implementation. Who decides that? that it's, uh... Google, because we built those operators, right? And just to remind you, there's like a, in the Hydro book, you can see the list of operators. It's like, wow. Then if, does it mean different operators have different uh, data flow models? Some of them are push, some of them. Well, I'm telling you, each one of these is either push or pull. Each of them can choose one or one of them? No, yes. One or one of them. That's correct. But when you put them together, can you put a one operator that say push, they don't pull, and it should be connected? In one of those graphs, right? Mm -hmm. they, then we'll partition the graph into a connected component of in out trees. So if you put push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, you get many in out trees. Mm -hmm. um, that's harder to inline. Yeah, which makes sense. If you're insisting on your control flow, keep switching event handling mode and scheduler driven mode, then that's what you wanted. Okay, then we're going to have to keep switching scheduling disciplines. The goal is, you know, most programs aren't like that. Yeah. So the, the push pull three part is it? I'm trying to get a handle of how that works on a distributed setting. Um, inbound in messages are um, these are handled by a push operator that takes them off the wire, so the operating system essentially pushes into an operator, or they go into a buffer and then you pull them. <clears throat> Which is you know, ever ever was it so when you dig down into the into the operating system that's what's going on is you have asynchronous handlers typically you know for right. network events and they right. do this right so if you look at active messages for example what active messages are is the network packet when it arrives at the processor contains the instructions that push it into a buffer that's what active mess that's the whole idea of active messages like okay we're probably gonna tenure on that or something you know um, but that's all it is it's like how do you make sure that you don't have to do a context switch or a function call or something to handle the event. But then because you want it to be really low latency, you just put it in a buffer and you get a... So that's all baked into the language. You can go also do that. We compile it, we make protocols that do the handling. Yeah. All right, let's jump back. Um, if you found all that very boring, maybe you'll find the next part more interesting or find it fun, you may find the next part boring, I don't know. But I want to talk about the call theorem and monotonicity and distributed consistency and lattices, at least at some level of intuition. So one of the classic challenges in distributed systems is replica consistency. So we have, you know, two agents, uh, this lovely couple, they're separated by geography, which means they're separated with latency, right? So they can't be in perfect sync, they don't share a clock. Okay. Um, and they share some data, like a variable x, x, x is equal to love. All right, so that's what's called common knowledge if you're a Joe Hoffman type person. <clears throat> um, and um, you know, this is the classic example is you want replica consistency for a stored key. I don't actually want that. I want replica consistency for a whole program and its behavior. And I'd be happy to have the state of the program vary as long as the behavior that's observable outside the program is the same. So we're gonna try to raise the level of abstraction from reads and writes or loads and stores to whole program consistency. That's going to give us latitude to have a lack of consistency at the data level, but whole program consistency at the visible outputs of your program. That's the game we want to play. But let's start talking about data replication. How do we know, say, agree on the value of the immutable variable x? It could be, right, that they get disconnected or there's a latency and one of them changes the variable and now they disagree. And it's terrible, right, because now they're going to start making decisions and moving forward, being out of touch and you know, she's going to find someone else to hang out with, and he's going to think everything's fine, and <laughs> may have been serious, right? This is not a rom-com, it's the opposite. Um, so um, if they disagree now, what can happen later? You get this thing that people call split brain, right? So <coughs> the system now has two components whose beliefs about the world are so distinct that there's no way to stitch it back together. 
And so we want to generalize all this, but not just look at this problem for storing a variable, but to look at this problem for like these individual people who have goals in life. Like what, what is the outcome for them, not what is the outcome of a, a variable inside the program? The classic solution though is to control the variables inside the program using coordination. And there's lots of coordination mechanisms from friends like, you know, Leslie Lamport, Jim Gray, people like that who worry about things like transactions or consensus. And the typical solution was, oh, you want to have parallel programs? That's too hard. We're going to give you the illusion that you have a sequential program. We're going to pretend that you're on a mainframe from the 1960s and you put in punch cards and your program ran sequentially. That is the abstraction we've been trying to maintain for 60 years, okay? Um, and that's what this does. Uh, particularly consensus protocols like multipaxos are trying to get a global total order of operations. And that will avoid confusion for sure because everybody's queued up to use the mainframe now, one at a time, okay? Um, and indeed, if you have contention, this goes back to those Hannah charts, that is what this will achieve. So I build the world's largest computing platform ever assembled, I call it the cloud. And you can use a protocol to make it work like a mainframe in the 1960s. Wouldn't you like to use this? No, this is terrible. Never use this. Use this as little as you possibly can. Sometimes you'll need to use this. So I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. These, these people deserve their training awards. This is all good stuff, but you should avoid this like the plague. You should always try not to use this. This is like an expensive thing, right? It's a sharp object. So this is expensive, not just in distributed systems or databases. As we saw with the anti-charts, this is expensive at the level of a single core. If you're doing test and set atomics, that means you're wasting time. You're doing things that are not the program's intent, you're doing things that are control flow, and you're doing it poorly, <laughs> right? If you have contention that you should have just scheduled the damn things and run it like the mainframe and not wasted your time using the processor to try to do test and set. 90% of the time was test and set. That's insane. You should just order the transactions and use the mainframe idea, just run them one at a time. All right, so if we're gonna have concurrent systems, we wanna own this. The real question is, when can we afford to not do this? These things solve the problem. So we can't just throw them away. So the big question is, when should we use these things and why? And I started asking this question 15 years ago, something like 12 years ago, and uh, there weren't any answers in the literature. It's kind of crazy. When do I need coordination? And if you go to a systems person, any, you go to Mike Carey, who wrote papers on this, and he's a grad student, I think. You know, what, what are transactions for, Dr. Carey? He's a grad student, he wasn't Dr. Carey. <laughs> But he'd probably tell you, well, if you have a contended resource that concurrent applications want to use, we have to control access to that resource. And that's a perfectly reasonable answer. Like, here's a contended resource, mm -hmm. right? And it's pretty obvious how to fix this problem. What would you do? Put in stoplights, right? And then north-south can go for a while, <laughs> east-west can go for a while, right? And life is good. So we can solve this with coordination. Did we need to solve it with coordination? Why did you use coordination, really? Like, why do we need it, really? Uh, you know, like, is there another way to fix this intersection? Yes, there's another way to fix this intersection. It doesn't use coordination, it uses three dimensions. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm playing three-dimensional chess. Okay, that's cool. Um, it's expensive, is it worth it? That's a whole other question, right? But there is a computational answer to this coordination problem that isn't about controlling access to a shared resource. It's about how do I solve the problem? Right? And really what I want to do is answer that in the computational context. When is coordination required? Like, theoretically. Right? And so this is a computational expressibility problem. Uh, suppose that you understand everything about your program. Which programs have some coordination-free implementation? Which programs don't? Right? There's all the programs, and then there's the ones that we can figure out a solution without coordination. So this is a you know, complexity problem or an expressibility, computability problem. If I gave you a language that didn't have coordination, what could you say? <clears throat> you could say the green programs. What are the green programs? That's not helpful. I want a description of this boundary. What is the edge of the green circle that helps me know if the program's inside or outside this circle? Right? P versus NP kind of reasoning for coordination freeness. And the answer is it's the monotone programs. Okay? So that was my conjecture in 2010 in the keynote um, that you could take all the monotone logic programs and they would be coordination-free consistent, and anything that would had non-monotone ex, uh, expressions in it would be not coordination-free. So it's an if and only if assertion. And I didn't say it quite right, it turns out, in the conjecture that I wrote up, uh, but some very good, uh, a brilliant um, 
grad student at the University of Kassel in Belgium, Tom Amelou, and his advisors crisped up the statement and proved the conjecture that it's bidirectional, that the monotone programs are the programs that, that have a consistent coordination free distributed distribution. So um, that may or may not be helpful. Let me try to clear it up, but I'll point out that we wrote a accessible, hopefully six page paper, really about Tom's work. You know, this is a, a, Peter Elbro and I are the authors on this because we sort of worked with Tom on this and we would <coughs> want to propose the problem at some level, but we did not solve it. Tom solved it. Um, and this paper helps explain the whole thing um, at a level that any computer scientist can understand with references to the work. But here's the intuition. We're gonna need to define a couple terms. And like a lot of database theory, the definitions are the hard part. Proofs aren't that hard, but you have to get the specification right. This is logic. Um, so consistency here, I want the same application outcome. So things that are visible that emerge from the program. I want that to happen everywhere, regardless of network shenanigans, like reordering messages and dropping them and retrying messages so they arrive maybe multiple times. Um, and also messages get batched sometimes. You know, you see a batch of messages so then you see a different batch of messages. So those kind of shenanigans can happen, but I still want everyone running this, a replica of this program to get the same outcome. Monotonicity is the definition of monotonicity. So this is just textbook. You have a function from uh, x to y, uh, from one domain to another. If x on the uh, domain is a subset of y, then f of x in the range is a subset of f. Yeah, that's just monotonicity by definition. And that's what we're gonna mean, right? So more input means more output. One of the nice things about monotonic programs is that you can emit answers early. So if you know something about x, you can say something about f x. Now, you don't have to wait for y to arrive. So you never retract anything in a monotonic program. And this is the key to why consistency is gonna work out, is that I can tell you as much as I know now, and I won't be lying. You can't make any assumptions about what I'm not telling you. But what I am telling you is true, and will always be. Why do you define consistency to be the application outcome will be the same regardless of the shenanigans? What about the readers? There's no readers, there's applications. Nobody should re think about reads and writes ever again. That's <laughs> <laughs> not a respectful <laughs> conversation. Your question is all foreign, sir. No, um, I left out a slide I like but, to have, but which is 20th century right. thinking is like gray and lampboard. It's like load, store, read, write. That got us to a certain point, and then we got stuck. And now we need to do 21st century thinking, which is so application so, so The classic example we use in transaction class, right? So Why I- Why are you teaching transaction class? <laughs> <laughs> ask ask Faisal. <laughs> okay. but, but now I look at the state of my account and I decide whether I want to purchase something or not. Yes. And credit is available, I go purchase it on credit because yes. my bank balance is good. Mm -hmm. So in, you may call it application, you can call it reading. This is sort of an application, right? Mm -hmm. I, uh, you I don't specified want... an implementation of your application by saying reading. That's the thing I'm objecting to is that, and if you see like Pat Helen's papers are the kitchen wisdom version of all of this. The way people write apps, they actually don't use transactions typically, but it all works out in the wash. How does it work out in the wash? That's the question. And the answer is here, is monotonicity. So you need to find a way to write your application so that it's not reading stale data or reading locked data, right? You need to, you need to write your application maybe in my yeah, language. Like, like I, I sort of right? get it. I think so I sort of get right. it. I sort of get it, but I think what may happen is with this view, mm -hmm. you may push in a lot more responsibility to the application, right? Or Perhaps to the application writer's language compiler. Oh, maybe. That's what that, I'm trying that, to do. Oh, I see. That's what I'm trying to do. Because yeah. I agree. Uh, getting the application people to think this way is a, is a long pull. Yeah. Yeah. But if you can get them to write code in Python and then compile it into some edition of their code that makes sense in this environment, then Perfect. they might say, yeah, that's the program I meant, even though maybe you just soften their program so it's a little more tolerant to old stuff, for example. But the truth is, you know, when you order from Amazon, Every once in a while, you get an email that says, you know what, we're out of stock, we're sending you a coupon. That was not in the program spec, right? And you know what happened? Your reads and your writes was a bunch of lies. So we're trying to lift that up into the programming model. And I think, you know, it's good for those of us who are in the weeds on transactions and so on to admit that Pat's had a point all these years and we should build tooling and math and stuff to support that viewpoint. Yeah. I think I'm being to understand the big picture here. The way you get monotonicity is with those timestamps, right? Say that's an example. I didn't, I, I, that's only an example. It's okay. not a mechanism. Okay. One way to get monotonicity is to say I love you yesterday. Causally consistent data with timestamps, and that's like a sort of a again we're kind of back to reads and writes. I gave it to you because I was talking about reads and writes. Okay. But it's actually kind of not that satisfying. So, right. 
that. But hold on to the intuition. This is still a good intuition. All right. And what Calm Theorem again is saying is if your program is green, it's monotonic, then you can run it without coordination and it will eventually be consistent in its outcomes. Let me give you a more intuitive example. Is anyone here over 18? So that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is age, right? So um, some people raised their hands. That was great. I like that first, first of all, because I didn't ask anyone to raise their hands. You guys like invent a protocol on the fly as cool. <laughs> you have visual broadcast, right? You have a visual broadcast medium and an autonomous sender, and you know you can do broadcast and it works. Wow, that's actually quite awesome as a social engineering thing that we raise hands. We only raise hands for monotonic questions, though. You knew without asking anyone else whether you were over 18. Who's the youngest person in the room? This is a hard question. Nobody's raising their hand, <laughs> right? Because you'd have to ask everybody else. Yeah? So you could start, you come up with a protocol like, you know what, I'm going to ask the person next to me, and then if I'm younger, I'm going to swap seats with them. Bubble sort, right? And eventually you can pull out. But you will have compared all pairs by the time you're done. Um, and so this is somehow a hard question. Well, guess what? This is just logic expressions, right? Does, does there exist in that such an x greater than 18? That's a existential predicate, it's monotone. Once it's true, it's true, right? Any exemplar makes this true. This is a, does there exist in that such that for all yx is less than y? I, I prefer to rewrite this with De Morgan's laws, not who's the person who's youngest, but who's the person that nobody is younger than? So who's the person such that there's no other person or the other person is younger than the person, okay? The thing I like about this is a big fat not, which makes me think of this as being non-monotone. So this gives you some intuition that like non-monotone programs are going to have to do stuff like ask everyone in the system what's going on, which is what transactions and consensus and stuff are doing. So this should feel good, right? This should give you some feeling that like, yeah, I think he's onto something. Let me give you a useful example. And this is classic. So in these systems, this gets back to your question about um, the timestamps. So the, the, the classic example for causal consistency, which is vector clock timestamps, is uh, Twitter clone. I built a Twitter clone with the causal, with Anna, actually, um, which we did. Um, and that's because Twitter is building trees of message threads. And when you want to add a comment to a thread locally, you're like, that was a ridiculous thing that person said, I'm going to flame them, right? You add a node and a parent pointer to the global graph, but you're a replica of the global graph, right? And that's monotone. You don't have to ask anybody, like, is it okay for you to be my parent? You just say, you're my parent. Right? And then eventually that information propagates through the system. It's totally just information accumulation. But now, and you know, if they come in different orders, the worst case scenario is a tweet that's sent. The worst case thing that happens here is a tweet arrives before it's parent. I'm pointing to a parent, you've never heard of that parent, you get my message, you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Just buffer it. Okay, and then everything will be fine. It's really still monotone. It's just if you want connectedness uh, uh, <clears throat> assertion, you just need to buffer. Okay. But it's all just growing. It's up, handles updates in any order. Right. Now let's look at a database log, or if you like a Paxos log, totally normal. So I want to add a node that has a reference to a predecessor in Tell the World. You come, I, I come after you, right? But it's supposed to be a total order. And the worst case here is that somebody else had already added this person as the predecessor. And you're not allowed to have two successors in a linked list. So these guys are in conflict. And this is non-monotone in the sense that the only way to fix this is to make one of these facts that we both asserted to be true now false. <coughs> okay. And this should convince you at least empirically or at least uh, spiritually that um, total, total order, which is the goal of these coordination mechanisms, is non-monotone. It's gonna require coordination. It's got a non-monotone behavior. Right? But there's lots of programs that you're not building lists, you're building trees and other structures. So hopefully that gives you a feeling. In the programming languages, distributed systems can be a really popular way to think about this is what are called CRDTs. CRDTs were inspired by the mathematics of semi-lattices. How are we doing on time? We got a little bit of time, not a lot. Um, and the idea with the semi-lattice is that it's a domain. Think of it as an object-oriented programming. You have some type S and you have one method plus. And that method is associated with commutative and item pointer, right? So all the plus method, call it merge. I can take two states of the system, I can merge them. And merge is, doesn't matter what order you do it in, doesn't matter how you batch up the merges, and if you send a merge request twice, it comes out the same anyway. 
that's a semi lattice. Right? That's what you learn in modern algebra class as a semi lattice. If you can write objects that adhere to this API, then you will get uh, um, eventual consistency of your storage. Right? Because all you're doing is merging things in an order independent. By the way, uh, first thing you'll learn in, in your modern algebra class about semi lattices is they correspond to partial orders, which with our Twitter threads feels good, right? There's something working out here. Partial order is semi lattices, they're actually isomorphic. So it, it should make sense that they're associated with Peter and then item and then eventually consistent. So that's cool. The problem with CRDTs is you're not allowed to read from them. <laughs> All the questions you guys are asking about reads, the people in this community said, our job stops with storage. Your state is eventually consistent. Your application, <laughs> I don't know, maybe what you please. And so programmers write blogs about how, semi, how CRDTs guarantee your program is consistent. And that's BS, because the first thing you do with one of these things is you read. You know, you're like, oh, cool, you stored state for me. That's nice. I'm going to read it now. <laughs> right? um, so you have to be really careful using these things. They come with a giant footprint. We wrote a paper about this in Deals with you last year. It's, it's really obnoxious. But um, CRDTs are cool, and you should know about them, because semi-lattices are a powerful component in thinking about all semi-lattices are inside the green circle. So that's the question. They don't answer the question, though, of what's the edge of the green circle, what's outside the green circle, which we call the parameter. They just say, if you're monotone, because semi-lattices are a partial order, if you're monotone, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so they just have the same thing. OK. Hydroflow actually comes with a lattice crate that you can build compositions of lattices. It's fancier lattices. This is the vector clock causal consistency lattice. It's a composition of a bunch of simple lattices. It's nice. So we have a sort of compositional approach to this. And we can sometimes convert straight line sequential code into this stuff. That we have a paper on that in this world last year, which is fun. I'm not going to get into this. There's not enough time. I did point out that in this data flow, everything is tied to the lattice. And therefore, that's why the compiler is saying that this data flow is safe to replicate, because all the data types in this data flow are lattice. So these algebraic types are part of the system, um, and it's important. All right, I'm going to briefly brag. As I mentioned, I won't really have time to talk much about compilation. But we had a global language like Hydrologic already called Daedalus from my last project. We haven't designed Hydrologic, so we're just starting with Daedalus. It was a global logic programming internal representation language we could use. I don't think we should use, but we could. Mm -hmm. And we built a Daedalus to Hydroflow compiler. And we can analyze the Daedalus for things like monotonicity, functional dependencies, data provenance, all sorts of good stuff. And with it, we can compile programs. And David Chu, my student, had claimed in 2021 that he could auto-compile things like Paxos into more efficient programs. So low-level distributed systems protocols themselves could be compiled where their little monotone <clears throat> subcomponents inside this non-monotone coordination protocol could be scaled. And we knew this was possible because a previous student of mine did it, Michael Whitaker, by hand. Again, sort of like the Chang'an story. Michael had handwritten uh, scalable versions of Paxos. And what David's trying to do is automatically optimize those programs from specs. So auto micro, auto, automate Michael Whitaker. He had a PhD student who wanted to automate him. Which, by the way, as a professor, is a great thing to do. You know, chapter one of your students do a thing. Chapter two of your students automate the thing in chapter one. You, <laughs> you get to keep working on the same problem for longer. And these, these things are thinking. But we're moving up the conceptual stack. So his first paper on this is appearing in Sigma. It only took him three years to learn Daedalus and Axos. It's a must. It's pretty painful. Um, there's lots of hard things about it I don't have time to talk about, but his optimizations are trivial. One is to take a data flow and break it into two with an asynchronous message edge, call that decoupling. The other is to shard a data flow, so partition its state and partition its messages, we call that partitioning. And with just decoupling and partitioning, those simple transformations, he's able to achieve better performance than Michael's handwritten code. So yellow is the output of the hydroflow compiler. <clears throat> Red is Michael's code, which is written in Scala, so not entirely fair. It's still a JVM language. It's pretty fast. Um, blue is blue is implemented in Rust, but Michael's all of Michael's optimizations. Wait, did I write? I don't remember. Anyway, we're faster than Michael. This is the upshot. And we just did it again this week. We're sending this to um, we're sending this to uh, Papak this week, but we did it again for business and fault tolerance. But we had to because now we are concerned about adversaries, we had to fix the rewrite rules to the adversary uh, tolerance. So it's very simple to fix. Um, that's in the workshop paper. And we're still getting better performance than, you know, we're auto-scaling. This is plain 
<coughs> this tifa type PFT and this is the aphromatic PDFT. This is pretty good for this. Okay, um, we're only halfway there. This is a query optimizer that has no cost model right now. We're hand applying the rules just to see if there was a cost model and there was a search algorithm, could it find a good program just by transforming? And the answer is yes, but we haven't done this part yet. That's the next chapter of David's thesis. There's a lot more open questions. We're out of time, so I'm gonna stop. Um, yeah, but um, we got a, a few papers out already, um, sort of at every level of the stack. There's a little bit of work on existing programs. There's a little bit of work on compiling programs for David. There's a bunch of work here that's embodied in a piece of software that you can look at. And then some work done here just recently that's appearing now, which is quite cool and I think kind of cool. So that's it. That's what I got. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Joe, for the very insightful presentation. Any, uh, we have time for maybe two quick questions. How many long ones? Long, long ones, maybe I'll stick around and come to lunch. Half, half a long one. <laughs> so maybe I do have a question that I'm somebody else. So, so I want to hear your thought on this thing. At some stage, you were discussing about basically building uh, this model where you get the right answer, but you sort of don't. Yeah, from the we sort of depend on. I want to hear content. Content models that can be, can we take this further if I did allow the wrong ones to go up to sort of completely break down the system. So to, to repeat the question, you know, what would happen if we took one of these programs and we allowed people to keep up with the covers at the state that we're saying is inconsistent, but it doesn't matter? And the answer is you totally can do that in the language. It's, it's absolutely allowed. And we'll just tell you that that edge is uh, non deterministic. Right? You deal with it. Deal with it in the same way we so do it. The application the writer will deal with it. Then, right. Yes. The application, if you want to write a program that's got non deterministic mm -hmm. properties, then um, that's cool. That can stop you. Yeah. And also, if you want to fix it, that's what's great. And it will be deterministic again. One of the challenges there is to prove that a protocol like Paxos is totally probabilistic, That's which is really, it would be nice for the compiler. It's, it's, it's not a lattice in, but it is a lattice in. That would be really interesting. That's a great question. It's absolutely true. Uh, hypothesis must be true, uh, but how do you go to truth? I can't see it. Can you explain? Yeah, maybe one more question from anyone. Global IR that split into yeah. local IR. I, I wonder if there's any connection between this idea and the creographic programming. The, the creographic programming is basically you, you write a global program that describes how multiple health communicates and then. The compiler would be you can specify it. I compile to this node now for that node, and you compile it separately. It will. I don't know the word. Okay. Oh, similar. I, I would be delighted. It's fine. Yeah. So we want to. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Hopefully, it's much smaller. It's a hard thing. That's your your IR. Any of the real graphic, so like a creography in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will remember. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so we're done. Thank you so much. Good to learn. Appreciate that. Next question. Almost time. I think we're done. Missing part. I had a question. 